Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this section, I'll take a break from valvular heart disease before my head explodes and focus on the cardiac pathology of myocardial infarction for a little change of pace. There's lots of mischief for the test writers to get into with cardiac pathology, so you want to pay attention to the little nuggets of information buried in this recording. And as a periodic reminder, all 12 days recordings have a PDF available at the website. I wonder if anyone actually looks at those things. And finally, before launching, this presentation fits into the larger topic of atherosclerotic heart disease. I've already recorded the presentation on chest pain and the anginal syndromes. I will get to atherogenesis and EKG localization in due time. So with that introduction, let's get started. Our focus in this video is on the pathology of myocardial infarction. Infarction for our purposes will include subendocardial and transmural MI, which are also referred to as non-ST or ST elevation MI. You will eventually need to be familiar with the EKG patterns of ST elevation MI. I will cover these in a separate video. To be clear, however, they assume you can interpret an EKG with ST elevation, and then they go on to ask derivatives. The American Heart Association does offer a set of complex definitions for different categories of infarction, but for the purposes of USMLE, infarction will have clinical features of angina, a diagnostic EKG, and or biomarker elevation suggestive of myocardial necrosis. To quickly review, there are two clinically relevant biomarkers of myocardial injury the CKMB fraction, and troponin. I would pay attention to the fact that they rise pretty early in myocardial injury, usually by four hours. The obvious and immediate implication is that a patient can experience sudden cardiac death without ever demonstrating evidence of myocardial injury. The other big ticket item here is the time it takes to reach 100% sensitivity, which is in the five to 10 hour range for troponin. So what is the implication of this information? Unfortunately, this story is too common. A young man presents to the ER with GI symptoms. The symptoms partially resolve with antacids. Initial troponin and EKG are negative. He is discharged after four hours in the ER and experiences a fatal arrest later that evening. This story is still too commonplace even in this era of medical discovery. The peak sensitivity of troponin is in the five to 10 hour range. A patient is not ruled out for myocardial injury at four hours. FYI, this is a life lesson in medicine, not a USMLE lesson. The other fun derivative is the duration of elevation. Troponin can remain elevated for several days compared with CK. This is a niche derivative for CK. So how will they come after you with this one? Here it is. Patient presents with MI. Three days later, he is having recurrent chest pain. What is the best biomarker to determine extension of MI? Answer, CK. The CK value declines more rapidly following the initial elevation. This is a sneaky little question for them to use on biomarkers, but now you know. So let's move ahead in our discussion of infarction. Just a quick word or two on what the USMLE likes to emphasize with subendocardial infarction. Besides the fact that the ST segments are depressed, not elevated, they want you to think about the vulnerable zones of ischemia. This is described by the wavefront phenomenon, which is simply meant to highlight that the subendocardium is the region most distant from the epicardial vessels. It is therefore most vulnerable. This slide graphically depicts what I just mentioned. First note how an EKG might look showing anterior and lateral wall ischemia with ST depression and T wave inversion. The next image reveals the subendocardial surface as most distant from the epicardial vessel. And finally, the top blurry image highlights the evolution of necrosis over time. You get the concept. If they ask you a question on this topic, it will be straightforward focusing on the most vulnerable zone of ischemia or the zone that demonstrates initial injury after a vessel is occluded. All right, let's finally get into the juicy stuff, the pathology of a myocardial infarction. In the remainder of this presentation, we'll walk through the key pathology and derivatives as the healthy heart evolves into and past the myocardial infarction. So let's start our journey from the beginning, looking at the first seconds and minutes following coronary vessel occlusion. I hope you're familiar with this graphic demonstrating the biochemical changes in early ischemia. It simply plots changes in ATP and lactate concentrations over time once a vessel has been occluded. And here are the typical test facts. 30 minutes marks the onset of irreversible cellular injury. Prior to 30 minutes, however, myocyte injury is still present, but if reperfusion can be accomplished, the cellular damage is reversible. Reversibly injured myocytes are referred to as being stunned. I don't want to derail our discussion, but it is worth highlighting the difference between studying and hibernation. 
as just mentioned, stunning refers to reversible ischemic injury following acute or subacute occlusion. Compare that to hibernation. Hibernating myocardium more generally refers to decreased LV function as a result of recurrent low-grade ischemic events. The EF may be reduced as the left ventricle is literally in sleep mode as a result of these recurrent ischemic events. However, following revascularization, impaired LV function may normalize. This phenomenon is referred to as myocardial hibernation. This is low yield for step one, but it is easy to see how students confuse the concept of stunning versus hibernation. Okay, getting back to business, we see the onset of irreversible injury at 30 minutes, but watch how they try to come after you. Here's a great and tricky derivative that flies beneath the radar. Pick the point on the curve where the myocardium stops contracting. Answer, 120 seconds. The ATP dependent pump stop working and the myocyte experiences loss of contractility. The purpose of this question is to test your understanding of contractility versus reversibility. Tricky and subtle, but a valid teaching point nonetheless. Well done. You grabbed the initial set of derivatives associated with coronary occlusion. Our next stop on the journey is the zero to six hour time frame. Here is the chart we'll be using throughout the rest of the presentation. You'll see the time frame followed by cell of injury, complications, and microscopic findings. This is a pretty standard approach. So what cardiac pathology can you expect in the first six hours? Answer, none. Yay, no cells or microscopy to worry about, just cardiac death from fatal arrhythmia. Obviously not to make light, but proximal occlusion of coronary vessels may result in fatal ventricular arrhythmias in death long before evidence of coagulative necrosis develops. Obviously, fatal rhythm disturbances can occur during other phases of myocardial necrosis, but for purposes of step one, you would be advised to link fatal cardiac arrhythmia with the initial presentation of myocardial ischemia. And so what will the typical questions look like? Here's a simple one. Patient develops chest pain and dies one hour later. What was the most likely cause of death? Answer, cardiac arrhythmia. And remember the fellow you guys sent home from the ER too soon? Here are the typical derivative questions. What do we see grossly or on histology? Answer, normal tissue. During the zero to six hour time frame, there are no histopathologic changes noted. Thus, the focus on cardiac dysrhythmia as the derivative of choice. All right, we've made it through the first six hours reviewing the typical questions. Let's move on to the next important time frame, one to three days. And here's where it gets a little bit more interesting for you and the board examiners. At this point, things should be more intuitive. We have myocardial injury. So which cells are typically the first responders? Correct, the PMNs. They should be first to arrive. So days one through three of myocardial injury are characterized by the neutrophilic phase. And as you can see, the principal complication during this phase is fibrinous pericarditis. So what kind of derivatives come up during days one through three? Here's the classic old woman found dead at home. Autopsy of the heart reveals a neutrophilic infiltrate. When did she die? Great stuff. They used the neutrophils to time her death somewhere between one and three days. And not to waste the moment, normal histopathology is present at one hour as we just reviewed, and at one week, the macrophages are at work doing what they do best, mowing down tissue. And here is the other key derivative during days one through three acute pericarditis. Just for clarity, we are talking about a transmural infarction with inflammation of the overlying pericardium. So this would not be an expected outcome if injury is limited to the subendocardium. And here's what a typical pericarditis question will look like. Patient with recent ST elevation MI. He has chest pain and refuses to lie down. Besides a cardiac friction rub, this clue in the right setting is the sine qua non of almost all pericarditis questions. So based on the clues of recent transmural MI and positional chest pain, they want you to choose the cause. And the answer would be serofibrinous pericarditis. Day two in your mind's eye should automatically evoke images of the neutrophilic response and related complications. Do note, in choice G, they list purulent pericarditis, referring to infectious etiologies, which would not be an expected post-MI complication. Fibrinous pericarditis is the correct pathologic description. I also include some quick associations you should make when viewing the answer distractors. Don't beat the wrong answers to death when going through the Q-bank, but when you see extension of MI, for example, they really should be giving you the CK. If CK is not mentioned in the question stem, it is unlikely to be the correct answer. You too should practice making these quick associations. So those were the key derivatives on days one through three. 
Let's move on to days three through seven. And here we are. We've arrived at the macrophage phase. I again show my favorite graphic, the macrophage hogs eating indiscriminately. They have a big appetite moving in to clean up cellular debris after the neutrophils have done their thing. When they are done eating, the myocardium is characterized by the disintegration of dead myofibers, creating clear regions with a Swiss cheese-like appearance. Consequently, the tissue is weakened, and it is during this phase that the tissue is most vulnerable to rupture. And who are the victims? Answer, the left ventricular free wall and the papillary muscle. So what will these derivatives look like? Rupture of the LV wall is their gateway to cardiac tamponade. You have hemopericardium and a patient with shock characterized by pulses paradoxes. Great derivative questions courtesy of the macrophages. And here we have rupture of the papillary muscle on day five. How will they present that complication? Answer, by the acute onset of congestive heart failure and a new murmur at the cardiac apex. You will recall this is the site and setup for a mitral regurgitation question. And those are the derivative complications. In terms of histopathology, they can present the clinical complications and inquire about the cell which gave rise to the tissue destruction. Answer, macrophage. I love those damn things. And now we are ready to wind down. The questions start getting less sexy. We're now a month out and predictably, the fibroblast has arrived and it's doing its thing. That being synthesizing and depositing collagen. In this phase, the complications and derivatives will be related to LV aneurysm formation. And I should mention, this is only a potential complication from a large transmural infarction of the anterior wall. And although this is not an invariable complication, on step one, it becomes a surrogate marker for this phase. The other complication beyond day 30 is Dressler syndrome, also referred to as autoimmune pericarditis. So what will this set of derivatives look like? Insofar as LV aneurysm, they can ask you the predominant tissue type, i.e. type 1 collagen, but aneurysm complicated by mural thrombus is way more exciting. They present a patient who had an anterior wall MI six weeks ago and now has a stroke. What was the cause? Answer, mural thrombus or LV aneurysm. And P.S. by the way, they also play the mural thrombus game with dilated cardiomyopathy. Insofar as autoimmune pericarditis, the pathology is the same as seen in acute pericarditis, that being a serofibrinous exudate. The unique derivatives are the target of autoimmunity, that being released myocardial antigens, and the timing of pericarditis. Obviously, this is not days one through three. Instead, we are out at weeks six through eight. Otherwise, the clinical presentation of pain while lying down and or friction rub will likely be described in the vignette. Hey, guess what? The material we just presented covers around 90% of the cardiac pathology you should be familiar with. For completeness, obviously something must occur between six hours and the neutrophilic phase. It is this hodgepodge of confusing terminology, including wavy fibers, edema, punctate hemorrhage, contraction band, and coagulative necrosis. There is no need to memorize this junk. Just be aware if they start talking garble, and it isn't neutrophils, macrophages, or collagen, they are in the six to 24 hour range. Sorry to be nihilistic, but sometimes we just need to be practical. And in a similar vein, what gives between the macrophage and collagen phase? Answer, days seven through 14 are characterized by granulation tissue and neovascularization. During this phase, you might see descriptions of loose collagen and abundant capillaries. This is low yield information because there aren't juicy clinical complications. Nonetheless, you should be familiar with this phase as well. And that'll do it. We went from normal myocardium to infarction and back again. And here we'll summarize the key points with which you should be familiar. You should know the time frame where we lose contractility and when we observe the onset of irreversible injury. You should be familiar with the initial complication of fatal cardiac arrhythmia. You should be familiar with the neutrophilic phase that permits an MI to be timed and the most common complication and presentation of acute pericarditis. They love the macrophage phase typically presented as day five post MI as the complications of LV or papillary muscle rupture give rise to a parallel set of rich derivatives. Greater than 30 days, we have the fibroblast predominant phase of wound healing with type one collagen. The common step one derivatives include LV aneurysm complicated by mural thrombosis and or the presence of autoimmune pericarditis. And you should have vague familiarity with the pathologic descriptions during these intercurrent time periods, which are lower yield. So now you can take this topic off your bucket list, but do bear in mind this was major high yield stuff for cardiology with lots of clinical pathologic correlations. I know this was a beautiful presentation, but don't get tearful. 
I just appreciate your coming to visit, but now I have to return to valvular heart disease. It was nice chatting with you today. And, as always, if you have any questions or concerns about any of the material presented, please contact me at 12 Days. Thank you.